Commissioner Bernays, who is here. Commissioner Dubanda. Commissioner Dubanda. Commissioner Aglock. Commissioner Ellis. Commissioner Jones. Commissioner Lark. Commissioner Rogers. Commissioner Rudd is not here. Commissioner Sheen. Go back. Commissioner Devonda. Are up 25% because of this. 
and then we made financial statements for the district accounts. Any questions? Novel algorithms for comprehensive 
untargeted detection of doping agents and biological samples. This is a really exciting um, new approach to doing what we call untargeted screening. And what I mean by untargeted screening is that we do not have a set defined list of drugs that we're looking for in the screen. We're looking for any differences in those samples from each other. So it's actually comparing every signal that we're measuring within that particular sample to all of the signals being measured in the other samples in that group. And it's using a mathematical algorithm to then identify samples that have something, a substance, that is different in one or two samples versus all the other samples in that grouping. Um, that's an oversimplified explanation, but um, what we're hoping this eventually will let us do is to be able to identify substances that we're just not aware are even being used, uh, and we don't have to know ahead of time, a priori, what that substance is. So we're, we're really excited about um, this new method and uh, seeing what it can help us do from a drug detection standpoint. Uh, the next study is entitled Gene Transcripts Expressed in Equine-like Blood Cells are potential biomarkers of extracorporeal shockwave therapy. This is a, another study looking for biomarkers of shockwave. And um, for those of you that have been and listened to my reports previously, you know that we've been working on this for a very long time. We previously published on protein-based biomarkers of shockwave. This is looking now at what are called mRNA-based biomarkers of shockwave. And uh, the next step in this project is to take all of the protein biomarkers and the mRNA biomarkers that we've identified, and again, to try and come up with a, a mathematical algorithm to figure out if we can make this specific for shockwave therapy. Uh, that remains to be determined. That's, that's the next step in the process. Uh, the sixth study um, is entitled A Quantitative PCR Screening Method for Adeno-Associated Viral Vector 2 mediated gene doping. Uh, this is the follow-up study to uh, a couple that I presented previously where I announced that we were able to detect a gene therapy product that had been given intraarticularly to horses in an experimental study um, at New Bolton Center. And what we did for this particular study, we wanted to come up with a method that would identify the vector that is being used to deliver the gene therapy independent of what that therapy is that it's, it contains. Uh, and the reason we chose the AAV2 vector is because it is the most common vector that is in clinical trials currently for gene therapy products. There's hundreds of trials ongoing right now. And uh, we wanted to make sure that if a product is approved or a product is available that is using this AAV2 vector, that we would be able to detect it in uh, equine blood and urine, and uh, we also are looking at synovial samples as well. Um, so that's the really exciting thing about this study is that now we have a universal non-specific method for detecting the AEB2 vector no matter which transcript it's containing, and we can use that as a screening method for detecting gene doping in horses. The final study that is uh, available ahead of print as an e-publication is entitled Pharmacokinetics and Pharmacodynamics of Oral and Intravenous Metoprolol Tartrate in Clinically Healthy Horses. And this is another collaborative study. Uh, the senior author on this study is Dr. Joanne Slack, who's a cardiologist at New Bolton Center. Uh, and the primary author on this study is Dr. Daniela Luthi who uh, investigated this particular drug, metoprolol, which many of you may have heard of. Uh, it's very commonly prescribed uh, in humans as well, uh, as well as it can be in animals. And uh, this is a drug that we know is, is, could be used in horses to treat heart conditions. And so we collaborated with them on this particular study to understand how long it takes for the horse to get rid of this drug and also make sure that we have a test available to be able to detect this drug and make sure it's not being used uh, inappropriately in horses that are in competition. There were three additional manuscripts submitted in 2021. One has now been accepted for publication as of January 11th of 2022, and there was an additional manuscript that was submitted January 19th of 2022. So I should have more information on those in a, a follow-up report. 
at the conferences that we attended in uh, 2021 were the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine Forum, uh, which was in a virtual format, attended in a virtual format. The 69th ASMS Conference on Mass Spectrometry and Allied Topics was held in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania this year. Uh, they gave me the opportunity to have some of my uh, younger chemists and staff do some uh, increased uh, training and continuing education since it was in Philadelphia. The 2021 American Association of Equine Practitioners Convention and Trade Show, uh, we attended virtually. And the 2021 Conference of Research Workers and Animal Diseases uh, in Chicago, Illinois. This was actually a conference that was uh, attended by one of my colleagues, Dr. Laura Redding, who um, we collaborated with on a project to look at the antimicrobial use in horses at the racetracks. Um, using the, the treatment sheet data that are available from the, the racing commission. Um, so this is, a, that was presented at that conference uh, and uh, it was the first study that has looked at the prescribing practices for antimicrobials in uh, racehorses. The other abstracts that were presented um, were by Dr. Luthi, who I mentioned earlier, the pharmacokinetics of oral and intravenous metoprolol tartrate in clinically healthy horses. That was presented at the ACBIM forum in 2021, and uh, Dr. Guan presented artificial intelligence-aided, untargeted detection of doping agents in biological samples that was selected for an oral presentation at the uh, 69th ASMS Conference on Mass Spectrometry and Allied Topics in Philadelphia. I know that was a lot of information to throw at you uh, very quickly, uh, and I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Thanks, Mr. Commissioner Edloff and Commissioner Condon have joined us. Let's see if any commissioners have any questions for you. This is Commissioner Rogers. I think it was the fourth published manuscript where you indicated that you could now detect something in a sample that does not appear in other samples. That sounds pretty exciting. They always tell us the cheaters are ahead of us. Does this mean we're catching up? That's exactly the point of that study. That, that is what we are trying to do. I can remember uh, testifying before a Senate committee you know, 10 years ago or so, talking about the future of the racing industry and finding that I didn't worry about tests because I knew you catch them with the biologists. I didn't worry about them. Uh, am I wrong now? Uh, I, th I think that. Um, the molecular biologists that I have working for me are excellent. Um, actually, uh, Dr. Joanne Hoffman, who's a veterinarian, but also has played a key role in this uh, gene doping project, uh, is here in the audience with us. So if you have more questions for her, you can certainly reach out to her. Uh, but we, we are trying to keep up with both the biologists and the chemists, and my training actually happens to be in both uh, biochemistry as well as molecular biology. Mm -hmm. So hopefully, hopefully that means you're wrong now. <laughs> You can beat me to this one if you wanted to introduce your colleague who I know is a co-author on uh, over half of these papers. Um, yes, yes, so Dr. Joanne Hoffman is my uh, research project manager, a veterinarian who is critical in the lab for helping to keep all of these studies um, <laughs> going. Her and the, Dr. Sweeney is asking for her to, to stand and be acknowledged. Um, and she certainly deserves that acknowledgement. She has been critical to helping to make sure that these studies all get completed. Uh, I, I'm the person who gets to stand up here and, and talk about all the great things that we're doing, but it really truly does take a very large team of people to accomplish all of this work. Um, and I am just so thankful to have everybody in the laboratory that I have working with me. I have a question for you, Dr. Rosen. Um, Mr. Rogers uh, asked the question earlier about the study that you were doing for you isolating from other samples, one sample. But tell us, what's the next step after that? Well, after we identify that there's something different in that particular sample, then we have to go to confirmation and figure out, well, what is it that's different in that particular sample? And can you always do that? No. Not always, but we're getting there. So there is a gap there. Yes. There is more work to do, for sure. Okay. Thank you. Yeah.
for sure there's always work to do. <laughs> Any other questions? Of course, yes. So, um, Dr. Kyla Orkven is an orthopedic surgeon and uh, uh, has a PhD as well. And she works at New Bolton Center as an expert in treating orthopedic disease and resources. Dr. Catherine Molster is our radiologist at New Bolton Center. They are very few and far between. There are not that many veterinary radiologists, especially that are uh, experts in equine. And I'm very excited uh, for you to see their presentation today. The, the work that they've been doing is using advanced imaging techniques to try and identify lesions in the horse's musculoskeletal system uh, before that actually results in a catastrophic breakdown injury. And so they are going to, to give you a short presentation and uh, they would be, I'm sure, happy to take any of your questions as far as how we could potentially use this technology to start screening horses and decrease the number of catastrophic injuries and resources. medicine specialist at the Bolton Center with a strong interest in both clinical and research interest in racehorse injury and fracture repair. And I'm joined today by Dr. Kate Wolster. Um, again, Dr. Robinson introduced her, but she is um, a specialist in equine imaging. Um, there are very few in the country, so we're lucky to have her. Um, and today we'll just be going over some of the logistical aspects of performing um, advanced imaging on racehorses, including CT, MRI, and um, more recently PET scans, and the information that can be gained from these different modalities um, that's hopefully um, and looking like it's likely to decrease or prevent catastrophic uh, injuries in racehorses. So I probably, many of you are aware of some of these images, but similar to human athletes, horses are remarkable at adapting their bones in response to training. It's one of the best qualities. Um, and they're able to lay down more bone where it's needed to garner more strength. So bones become denser and thicker, thereby conferring increased strength. And when you look at, hopefully, I can't see my pointer. So on the right, sorry, the will help. There we go. She's very tech savvy. This over here. Um, so if we look, um, okay, here we go. It's very complicated. Um, so if we look at the CT image on the right over here, it's it's on again, I'm just going to keep going. Um, in the, of a racehorse in training on the bottom, you can see that um, the, the racehorse cannon bone is much thicker. And there's been replacement of the less dense, darker central bone with denser white bone. And this is the normal adaptive response this, um, that we like to see in racehorses because it indicates that they are physically prepared for the training and the racing that they're going to be going through. I'm sure many of you are also familiar ooh, now we have a um, familiar with these images. So the fetlock is the most commonly injured part of the thoroughbred racehorse. Injuries can develop subsequent to normal high intensity training, analogous to injuries that occur in elite human athletes, for example, long distance runners with stress fractures. We think this, this occurs because of the adaptive process. Um, the adaptive process gets overwhelmed
Okay, so um, like I said, many of you are very familiar with these sorts of injuries. So condylar fractures are one of those very common injuries that we see in resources and that we're really ideally trying to prevent. So the left hand image is an x-ray, single x-ray, um, of a horse with a displaced complete lateral condylar fracture um, that's affecting the distal aspect of the cannon bone. The middle image is a CT image that gives us more detail. And you can see that this horse has an incomplete lateral condylar fracture. So we can see that line, it's just much more difficult to see. And thankfully with the CT, we're able to get a much clearer image of it. The right hand image is another x-ray, and this is just a specialized projection. It's a flexed projection that allows us to more critically evaluate regions that we, are known, that we know are predisposed to fracture, so right um, in that parasagittal region, um, just next to the sagittal ridge. Well, x-rays are really helpful and used readily on the track and in many practices and at New Bolton Center, they are not the most sensitive at detecting subtle changes in the bone. And so we and others, many others across the country, are trying to develop a much more sensitive tool to catch horses much earlier in the stage of uh, bone injury so that we can, uh, we can find those horses, um, pull them out of training if needed, and prevent more serious injuries from occurring. Another commonly injured site that can, be, can lead to more catastrophic injuries is the, is the thoroughbred um, sesamoid bone. Similar to what I showed you in the cannon bone, we have areas in the sesamoid bone that develop focal areas of weak demineralized bone, and you can see them on the images here, all outlined with the yellow arrows and the red hem, uh, semicircles. These areas predispose these the sesamoid bones to mid-body fractures, and like I mentioned, can be catastrophic if they break. These, in particular, the reason I'm showing showing this specifically is that these changes in the sesamoid bones are almost impossible to detect with a plain X-ray. Okay, so now we're just going to go um, and show you how we acquire images of the fetlock um, in the standing for each of these modalities, and we're going to show you what the focally weakened bone looks like for each of the modalities as well. CT or CAT scanner at the University of Pennsylvania's Large Animal Hospital, New Bolton Center. Uh, the process to acquire images of the fetlock is fairly uh, quick and straightforward. Horses are lightly sedated and placed on a platform. A cuff is placed around the horse's ankle to compensate for any motion during the scan. And the imaging of any one individual fetlock takes about 30 seconds. Um, imaging of all four fetlocks takes approximately 10 minutes. And that's a little bit dependent on the temperament of the horse, um, but it works It works quite well. So I'm just gonna let this play a little bit more. These are our wonderful technicians, um, Josh and Katie. And let's see. I don't know if I can see that for video, but it's almost there. And basically the system utilizes a synced um, X-ray tube and detector. So these are some examples of um, the types of bone weakness patterns that we see in the fetlock. Some are linear and occur in the groove that we showed you before. So that's let's see right that's this area right here. Um, and then that's um, within a large area of surrounding uh, what we call sclerosis. And the sclerosis is the normal adaptive response of bone to training. Um, some of the lesions are linear, um, again, and occur in the groove right here. And we consider these to put the horse at risk of fracture because if you look at the location, it's in exactly the same spot that a lateral condylar fracture would occur. Um, some of the areas of bone demineralization are ovoid or round. That top right image is indicative of that. And um, they occur to the side of the groove. And these lesions um, can have a characteristic pattern. They can have some that are round, some that are linear. So that lower left-hand image um, is indicative of that upper back. So this one has characteristics of both. Um, and this is also a type of lesion that can predispose the horse to fracture. And the, so the, that upper right hand ovoid lesion is most similar to what trainers and vets 
refer to as bone bruising. That's probably a term that you guys are very familiar with. Um, however, all of these are a spectrum of the same disease process. So it manifests in different shapes and locations, but it's all the same process. Um, and only certain lesion types would probably predispose the horse to fracture. So that ovoid lesion type much less likely to cause a fracture, while that left-hand linear lesion type is much more likely. Um, the other thing that is important to note about the CT appearance of the fractures and even identifying the fractures on CT is that the pattern is not predictable. So based on horses' confirmation or how they train, nothing tells us exactly what the lesions are going to look like on the CT. And so the CT is really critical um, in order to give you that uh, what we call lesion morphology, which refers to the lesion shape. So this is actually just a video of acquisition of uh, fetlock images using a standing MRI. The point of this is just the patient preparation. So for the standing MRI, the horse has to have their shoes removed. Um, and then each uh, imaging of each fetlock takes approximately 45 minutes. So we're talking 30 seconds for a standing CT and about 45 minutes per, per fetlock. So it's a little bit more limited in terms of um, its use as a screening tool. And the other problem with MRI, I guess, is that because it takes 45 minutes to scan the horse, any motion is more problematic when you're trying to interpret the images. So sclerosis, or that increased bone density on MRI, um, it's essentially the opposite of an x-ray. So the dark areas are regions of very dense sclerotic bone. So this area right here is the, is the sclerotic bone. And then the white areas are actually areas that have abnormal fluid. So this area um, is essentially increased fluid in the bone. And then also this linear fissure right here. So this is the same example of a, the predisposing lateral condor fracture injury just on an MRI. And then the top right image is actually a horse that has more of that bone bruise type lesion. So you have this large area of sclerosis here and then that ovoid um, bone bruising lesion um, right here. These lower images are actually just to show what the image quality can look like in terms of differences between what we call, what we refer to as a high field magnet, which is a magnet that requires the horse to be put under general anesthesia. It gives you the best quality images, but Obviously, as a screening tool, that's not realistic because you would have to anesthetize the horse, whereas the right-hand image is from a standing magnet. Um, and this right-hand image is actually also a cadaver, and so it doesn't even show the motion that can happen from the MRI. So this is our sort of most exciting uh, new imaging modality. This is the standing pet system at Evans and Bolton Center. And this is the same system uh, that was brought up in the proposal um, by the Racing Commission for the new guidelines. It's a simple process to image the horse, and imaging each fetlock takes approximately three to four minutes. And you can see from this horse, it's very lightly sedated. It's a very innocuous process. Um, the horse is very calm during the whole procedure, and it, it's quite fast. There we go. So the PET scanner is extremely sensitive at detecting areas of bone that are undergoing abnormal or excessive remodeling would show up as white um, or yellow, what we call hot regions, on a red background. So um, this image at the top right over here is actually a normal horse. So you can see it has like a very uniform um, single color, so to speak. And then this is actually a video, hopefully this will play, of a clinical racehorse that had um, lameness in the left forelimb that we, we actually couldn't tell from the blocking if it was going to be from the foot or the fetlock. And so the horse underwent an MRI, and the horse had lesions in both locations. So lesions in the foot and lesions um, in the fetlock. And so what we did is we actually performed a PET scan of this horse, and that demonstrated to us the horse had no abnormal uptake in the foot, but this lesion in the fetlock was extremely active. And so this was indicative to us that this was the problematic lesion, and the lesions in the foot were more chronic and likely unlikely to be causing the horse's lameness. The top right row of images, um, this is from another clinical horse with lameness localized to the fetlock. Um, the difference sort of between this set of images and the other, you'll notice this doesn't have a specific lesion shape. It shows us that it's abnormal, but it doesn't tell us anything about the lesion morphology or lesion shape that we're talking about. The middle images are actually from 
a longitudinal study, so a study over time that Dr. Ortbeg will reference later, and this looked at unraised two-year-olds followed by um, imaging at six months and one year into training. So these were horses that were not presented for lameness, they were training normally. This horse was um, reportedly not training well, but was not overtly lame. And the horse had a very subtle lesion in the lateral groove of the cannon bone on CT, and then we actually did the PET scan to confirm if it was active. And so this horse had quite significant uptake um, in this region um, that we, of a smaller abnormality that we saw on the CT. And then finally, the bottom image is just, just the same horse that's actually in this video. And essentially, the PET scanner just does a really great job of identifying areas that have abnormal turnover, um, but it doesn't necessarily provide the same information about the lesion shape. Um, and so using the CT and the MRI is quite complementary. Okay, so I'm just gonna show a couple cases to demonstrate some of the things that we've seen more recently. So this is a two-year-old thoroughbred colt who was reportedly lame in the left front three weeks ago after breezing, then improved, then was severely lame again um, in, the same, in the same leg after a breeze the, current, the week that this scan was performed. So in the bone scan um, on the left-hand side of the screen, we see that there is increased uptake, and you can see sort of a similarity between the bone scan and the PET scan images. Um, the bone scan also has those areas of increased uptake or activity consistent with abnormal bone turnover. So there's uptake in the, in the left front medial sesamoid bone, um, shown by the arrows on, that, on the bone scan. The horse underwent standing MRI, which are the images on the right. And it was, using the MRI, there was no definitive diagnosis. We couldn't tell exactly what was going on in that uh, sesamoid bone, the medial sesamoid bone. The same horse came in for further evaluation at the Bolton Center. Um, we did the standing CT, which is the two images on the bottom. So again, the standing MRI images are at the top of the screen, the standing CT at the bottom of the screen. And now you can see, clearly see there's a crack or a small fracture in the sesamoid bone. Um, you can see that with the green arrows. So this is an example of how we can pick up um, very subtle bone injury in, uh, in, Cessna, in the Fetlock region in general using the standing CT. These next, few, these next few slides, I'm just going to show you some images um, from a recent study we completed at New Bolton Center as part of a multi-center study. Um, so this study was done in collaboration with the, uh, UC Davis, University of California Davis, specifically with the group that we need that work to develop the PET scanner for horses, both um, originally when it was done under general anesthesia and now um, the PET scanner that's being used standing. So in collaboration with them, the goal of the study was to scan successfully racing thoroughbreds between the ages of two and four years old. And these horses were selected, they had to finish in the top 50% of a race within the past two weeks and they had to be sound at the time of racing and following the race before they came in for their PET scan. So we took these, this group of 25 horses, we did a PET scan and, and a standing CT. And you'll see now this is a little bit different than what we were looking at before when Dr. Wolster was just showing the PET scan images. When, they're over, when you, we can overlay the PET scan images with the CT images and it gives us much more detail about what we're seeing uh, in, the, in the abnormal PET scan. So on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see that there is um, increased uptake focused over the medial condyle, the medial dorsal condyle of the fetlock. And it's pretty significant activity, uh, uh, increase in activity. And when we look to the right of the screen, and I'm gonna try to come all the way over. Oh, I did it, yeah. When we try and come all the way over, we can see that there is a small crack in the medial condyle here as well. This is the second horse. Um, this is another example. This was from the same study, so it's a successfully racing horse that finished in the top 50%. This was a little bit um, worrisome to us when we first saw it. Horse came in for its scan. You can see the CT we performed first, and we can see that there is a pretty good um, incomplete fracture line in the lateral condyle of this pet block. When we performed the PET scan and overlaid it, you can see that the, in, the activity in the PET scan is um, very intense. 
uh, and that the intensity of the PET scan uptake correlates with the severity of disease, we think. So just in summary, um, catastrophic, catastrophic fractures um, are most commonly secondary to pre-existing disease. They don't occur as a single event. So advanced imaging will allow us to provide earlier detection of pre-existing injury that could result um, in catastrophic injury if left undetected. And we do know that bone is not only excellent at adapting to training, it is also excellent at healing if given the appropriate time. PET is extremely sensitive for detecting these lesions, um, and not all lesions increase the risk of catastrophic fracture. Because of its sensitivity in detecting the presence of lesions, PET is likely to be the most practical and promising imaging screening tool for um, track site evaluations, and then with some horses needing obviously further evaluation with something like a CT or an MRI. And with that, I will end this and take questions.
the ligament itself or how the ligament inserts on the bone, it's actually from this disease process. So I'm so glad that you brought it up because this is a very new information that is only really just being discovered because of all the work the, the Davis group has done. And so um, this identification of this lesion should decrease the amount of breakdown injuries because of this identification. Um, and then the second clarification I wanted to make. It acted on. I'm just sorry. It acted on. I mean, we can identify things all day long, but it acted up on. Uh, Correct. Yeah. Okay. That's sort of not our purpose. Yes, I am. That's, yeah. 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 And so the second thing is actually the, um, the PET scan is not limited to bone evaluation. So in human medicine, it's actually most commonly used for oncologic or cancer screening. And so we use a glucose analog in order to evaluate the soft tissues as well. So we can address both of those problems with different answers. Um, just one, one further thing. I know we have to move on. Um, but I think you bring up many good points. And I mean, in an ideal world, we'd be able to prevent all catastrophic injuries and be able to diagnose everything. And I think what what seems to be sort of exciting right now is that we've made some some feels like significant strides in, and we, in the studies that we've done with this PET scanner, um, and a lot of the studies they've done at Davis, have focused on the fat loss because it's the most injured, and it's easy for us to image. Um, and, and hopefully we can take this information and then keep moving forward. If we can prevent some catastrophic injuries, fantastic. Um, and then hopefully that'll be a step in the right direction. But it's, it's I mean, it's certainly, in an ideal world, it would be different. No, I think you're absolutely 110% right. And I just, with, from what I've talked to people in California, it's not being used as much as was originally thought by the horsemen. And that's a little disappointing after the original subsidized studies. Yeah. Yeah. One thing that was truly very surprising to us was, um, the, again, those two of 25 horses that were racing successfully with such significant imaging uptake. And obviously, it's very important to correlate the the clinical findings with the imaging, we absolutely can't use them separately. Um, but I think everyone in this room is, you know, aware of horses that, you know, if we could clearly identify the problem, we wouldn't be racing in the first place. And so um, it's, it's an interesting disease process that seems to be more prevalent than we were first thinking when we started this study. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, any other questions for commissioners? expert on the nerve 
and uh, Michael Dickinson and his group is the respected experts on the Topeka service. So Parks has done theirs with Peterson. I've been informed by Eric that the National has reached out to Nick and they are scheduling. And Matt Ennis told me that they will be reaching out to Dickinson prior to the meeting to have their service. So number one is done and we are in the process of being done. Number two, which was the increased monitoring and oversight of the AM Works, that has already started to take place in parks. Um, but I'm going to be totally transparent with this. It's not on a six day a week, four hours a day basis. It's on a limited basis due to staffing. We are working on the staffing. And, and the important thing to understand with the lameness issue and looking at the horses, we need vets that can actually take a look at a horse and make the call. So, what you see is our more experienced vets are being deployed in the morning. That's where we want to get to. And some of the newer, less experienced vets will be drawing blood and so on like that. But it's a process we started. I, I, I believe we will have Penn National up and operational by March 1st doing it on a limited basis. And I've talked to the vets at Presque They will start it. I'll skip three and come back to it. Number four, the trainer must submit a pre-entry form and the racing panel has been set up. The racing panel will be set up. That can be done by March 1st. As far as the submission part of a pre-entry form, that's going to take a little bit of time. Um, that's a working process. Number five was the rule to lower and lower level conditions or classes of horse that doesn't finish in the top four and five consecutive races. That's going through, a, uh, I call it a tweaking process. Um, after much thought and discussion with the commission, as it opposed to saying the top four positions, it's within 12 lengths. So the new rule will read within 12 lengths and five consecutive races. There's a few more tweaks I have to work out with the commission to be a trap rule, but I think we'll get there by March 1st. Six, which is the practicing vet to conduct an examination within 48 hours. Um, that one is a guidance document that can roll up under a current reg for the veterinarians. That will be implemented March 1st. Seven talks about the intraarticular injections. That, that I'll come back to. Eight is established stricter criteria for the removal from the vets list as a policy, and that currently is being put in place as we speak. That will be a go March 1st. I'll come back to 9 and 10 in a minute. The last item that will be in place March 1st will be the Pennsylvania State Horse Racing Commission Integrity Hotline. Um, this, this line will be set up to report unethical, illegal, or suspicious activity. Uh, we'll request a detailed message. All calls shall remain anonymous. Um, this will be not manned. It will be a call in, you leave a message. Conversations with the horsemen. Some people would like to comment on certain things. This will be their opportunity. Tony, it's both for the standard bread and the thoroughbred to call in. And between the two bureau directors and the director of enforcement, to take the calls from both world to determine um, what action is needed. As far as posting, we'll have it up on our website. Um, we will put it at the racetracks, the race office, the commission office, the stable gate, in the barn areas. Um, I will talk to, Tony and I will talk to the tracks. We'd like to put it in the programs, and possibly on their website. I mean, I have a list of about as long as my arm, but I'm not going to go all of it. But generally speaking, it's going to be very simple. You can dial in. There's no tracking or anything. You get your message and move on. Those are the things that I can tell you will actually be in place March 1st. The items that are going to require best method, determining the best method to implement is number three, which is the practicing that to attest the horse is fit and serviceable. I think that's doable and it just needs a little more time to work out the, the nuances and the operational flow of that. Number seven, which is the injections. We currently have a policy or a rule 
14 days of racing. Um, this is going to require regulation to modify. Number nine is the pilot program for the PET scan. We're in conversation to try to determine what the best method is to this. Obviously, the industry is interested. We're having conversations with the best way to do this. I'll be back to you in the near future. And 10 on the database, and so we're setting up the IT side of this, so that'll be down the line. So basically, 7, 9, and 10 will be in the future when I'll be able to tell you as we look for I think that Madam Chair, oh, and the one other thing on the continuing education, this commission months ago, back last year, asked for legal and staff to draft. That's got to be a regulation, and that's in the process as we speak. Madam Chair, I'd like to say this is, particularly, first of all, I want to commend you and your staff and the other members of the commission for the excellent job you've done in accomplishing uh, most of the good things that were on the list. I didn't expect this may to be affected by March months, so but I congratulate you for the effort you've made with the horsemen and the operators and the staff. So congratulations on that. The second thing is I was going to ask that a lot of the list when we came out with the list in the last meeting that, that are, these are going to be some publicity or something that on the thing we have accomplished by March 1 and, uh, and moving that forward so we get, let people know that how much we have accomplished that is going to go back on March 1. Just note that Shannon uh, is with us from our communications office. Do you want to come up and ask a question, a question for our communications staff? Sure. Sorry to push you out the slide, but it's real estate. Shannon Powers, the press secretary for the Department of Agriculture. Short answer to your question, and I'm honestly not sure who, which commissioner is asking. <laughs> Sorry, Commissioner Devundant, um, you're a dark shadow up there for us. Um, the short answer to your question is yes. Uh, part of that publicity couldn't really start until after this meeting, so yes, uh, we will be certainly publicizing the hotline and its availability and then the steps that have already been accomplished. The link to the list of checkpoint safety recommendations, checkpoint safety actions is actually on the website and we had a number of uh, reporters come right through at the last meeting so it did get some good publicity and a good story out there already. Well, thank you for that response. We're glad to see that. Hope I'm not a dark spot anymore. You have a face now. Thank you. Thank you. Chair, a motion to approve Prescott Downs 
five racing calendar. Uh, just as a point for the commissioners, Todd Mostefer advised me that they had conversations with the press Isle management and they're in agreement with this racing calendar. Two issues. First one is uh, I 
I forgot to put on the, the agenda. As far as out of competition testing goes, we did 36 out of competition tests at parks in January. Uh, Coney has lined up uh, probably close to 30 or 40 in the near future, and I've got 10 national on the radar screen. So, with the advent of the break in the weather, there's more out of competition tests done. The, the second issue is just confirming something that's already public that I had some calls for. Um, I, I'd like to confirm that, in fact, Juan Vasquez had a hearing with the stewards, which issued two 15-day uh, suspensions and total of thousand dollars and eight MMP points for Vanessal in two different races, one in late August and one in the Turf Monster. That process will continue. That process will now go to a hearing officer and then ultimately to the commission for final decision. So the stay in the appeal was granted. Marcus Vitale is the second case. Marcus Vitale had a confirmation that he had methamphetamine positive. Um, he went through the stewards hearing. They issued a one year suspension, $10,000 fine and the horse got 90 days on the vest list. The fatality requested to stay in appeal. It was granted. That also will go through the hearing process that every other case does. We'll go to a hearing officer and then come before the commission for the final determination. So both of those are in process and we'll see what happens. Okay, thanks, Tom. Uh, we'll go to the industry reports. I'd just like to remind everybody that's on teams to, for the benefit of the court reporter to please state your name and, and spell it, please. Uh, why don't we start off with Scott Lisher from the Meadows. Scott. Uh, thank you, Tony. Um, my name is Scott Lisha. Uh, the last name is L-I-S as in Sam, H-I-A. Um, Madam Chair, members of the commission, thank you for today. Uh, just a couple things. Uh, one, February has been a uh, up and down month with 60 degree weather and some serious bad weather, winter weather. Uh, we did happen to lose one day of racing uh, due to track conditions. Uh, unfortunately, we got a lot of rain and then some dropping temperatures that came frozen underneath and unsafe. But uh, again, and I, and I just have to reiterate this, uh, much thanks to the horsemen supporting us here with allowing us to close the track for training in the morning and working with us to race and, and our track crew. Uh, they do a phenomenal job and uh, and I think it goes unnoticed a lot of times we say it here, but uh, really hats off to, to the whole group here uh, for that. Um, as many of you know, we, did, uh, we were doing an experiment with uh, shortening our drag and post times. Um, we went through the first six weeks, I'd say, of the year, um, we didn't see any uh, any benefit to it in actuality. We were somewhat handcuffed, which I knew we would be uh, trying to adjust on the front end, setting post times and moving um, just from staffing personnel, and you can pull it in three directions if you're not watching uh, every race at every moment. So we are going back to still maintaining uh, a very short drag after post, uh, two to three minutes. But if we have to adjust to stay off of the track, uh, we're going to, to make those those shifts on the back end. Uh, it just affords you a little more freedom. And, um, you know, we, we gave it a run, but uh, we think it's best because the real key is staying off of all the tracks as much as possible. Um, and then lastly, uh, and, and tell me, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe our, uh, our state veterinarian, Dr. Uh, John Stepson, is uh, moving on after this week, and I'd just like to uh, thank Dr. Stepson for his service here and working uh, with protecting and taking care of the horses as well as working with the horsemen um, here at the Meadows. Thank you very much. Thanks, Scott. You're right. Dr. Stepson is retiring February 24th. This is his last official day, so he'll be missed. Thanks. Um, how about Mike Zollinger from Pocono? Mike, are you on? I am on. How is everyone today? Uh, Mike, M-I-K-E, Z-U-L-L-I-N-G-E-R. 
L-L-I-N-G-E-R. Uh, so we have our first three rate days under our uh, belt so far this year. Uh, things have gone very smooth at this point. Uh, we're actually able to have a 15 rate card on Saturday and on Sunday uh, and an expiration rate for their both days. So just getting back into this week of things, uh, not much else to report. Uh, looking forward to a, a good season and making some plans with our uh, marketing team as to what we can do uh, for our great fans that's coming here. So more to come on that. Um, that's all I have this week. Thank you, Tony. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Barry Brown from Harris. Barry? Yep, thank you, Tony. Uh, Barry Brown, B-A-R-R-Y-E-R-O-W-A. Uh, no real report this month. Uh, we are still in our downtime. Opening day is scheduled for Sunday, April 3rd, and we look forward to getting uh, getting underway. Thank you. Thanks, Barry. Uh, Joe Wilson from Parks. Joe? Welcome. This is David O'Fajan, Director of Racing at Parks. Name D-A-V-I-D, left name O-S-O-J-N-A-K. I just wanted to uh, thank the commission for having us today. Um, and just keep you informed that we have our, our first line of Park Madness. It's a take on March Madness, which is going to be run on March 7th, 8th, and 9th. Um, we will, over the course of those three days, we will have seven to $100,000 $100, stake races. Um, they're named for local towns in the city area. And we will have eight starter handicaps named for eight um, universities in Pennsylvania. It will be the Durham Nova, the LaSalle, St. Joe, Temple, UK, that's the Philly Big Five team. And then we also have in Westchester, Penn State, and Drexel. So we're hoping for a big, uh, big week of racing that, that week. And hopefully we have nice weather. Thank you very much, everyone. David, would you also add in there the, the max series and where that's going, if you don't mind? Well, yeah, um, also, and would you three days, we're going to have enhanced courses for overnight races. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, and we are in the planning phases with the match of the Mid-Atlantic Starter Championship. Um, keep on um, track to come up with a match schedule. So I'm not sure if they released the things yet. So I have to think that they will be able to do it this week. Okay, they're going to be doing this, this week. Um, so Parks will be hosting right now. Um, it's still, I guess, going to be finalized, but Parks will be hosting the final leg of the match series, which will be October 3rd. Um, and we'll also be running two of the turf legs um, in mid-June mid -June, um, for, uh, for uh, Penn National. Will be part of their two charters that they need to do that that week. So, uh, so we're looking forward to that, to Matt and our parts benefits. Thank you. Okay, thank you, David. Sounds like you got it busy. Uh, yeah, Eric, pretty busy. I see Eric's here. Eric, you want to come up? Uh, Eric Johnston, J-O-H-N-S-T-O-N. Uh, just trying to get through the remainder of the winter here. The joys of winter racing are always such a pleasure. Uh, and certainly challenges as we fight weather up and down. Uh, this year has been no different. We did have one cancellation so far in the month of February, but I think we're going to be fine for the rest of the month. So we get into March. Uh, we're very excited that the uh, Penn National Stake Schedule will be out here very shortly. The highlight of the stake schedule, as always, will be the Penn Mile, which is scheduled for uh, Friday, June 3rd. $400,000 grade two event will be the feature on the race with the, uh, with the Penn Oaks, which is a, a listed race for $150,000. And then Brian and the uh, readers have supported the day with four additional Pennsylvania grants uh, stakes that day, $100,000 stakes. So that will be a Glenn race card. We will be announcing a special post time upon approval, which we'll probably request next week. But that is going to be a Friday evening card, so we're very excited about that. Um, also, we, as mentioned, we will be participating in the match for uh, the Mid-Atlantic Thoroughbred Championship Series. 
on June the 17th, which is also a Friday evening. We were running the uh, two uh, third sprints for Phillies and Bears and for the uh, older boys. So we're excited about that. And then we have created another day on the 8th, uh, August 19th, uh, which is going to be the official date of our celebration for our 50th anniversary. So on that day, we have created four new stakes, which you have not made yet. But they will uh, four new states that will be restricted to horses that have run at Penn National in 2022 and have not won a stakes race, so we don't have some heavy heads coming in for, for those races. Keep that money at home, keep it uh, to the horsemen and the horses that have supported the program throughout the year. Other than that, we're just looking for a great summer, and uh, that's all I have. Any questions? Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Um, Matt Ennis from Presque Isle. Matt, are you on? Hi, Ian. Uh, this is Matt Ennis, M-A-T-T, -T, last name E-N-N-I-S. Uh, Five month for us in January, February here. We're just offering simulcasts to our patrons. Uh, we are excited for the commission's approval today for our live racing calendar. Uh, I'm working with the HBPA and the commission to discuss opening our backside timing with the uh, start of May 16th. Um, I have made available all live racing positions for Prescott this year and seen a spiked interest uh, coming post-COVID when we had short seasons of 52 and 60 race days. Now that these horsemen are able to uh, understand there's a 100 race day commitment from Prescott and HBPA and the commission, um, they're very excited and an overabundance of applications this year, which is exciting. It makes my job a whole lot easier. Additionally, our stall application uh, is available just recently online for our horsemen to uh, submit and we can start understanding our, our stall allocation and just really looking forward to opening our backside sometime in uh, mid to late April and getting kicked off once again for 100 days and come May 16th. So uh, looking forward to the season. That's all I have. Okay, thank you, Matt. Uh, we'll go to Horseman now, Mike Curran. I see you're here, Mike. Good afternoon, Commissioners. I uh, just wanted to give a report on the beginning of Poconos meet. Uh, entry box has been extremely strong. Uh, we had 14 races the first Saturday, 15 the last Saturday and Sunday, and we're going to have 15 each day uh, the coming Saturday and Sunday. Uh, last Saturday was the start of our claimant series up there. We had 31 claims, uh, successful claims. Uh, it's been a successful start to me, and I just want to thank uh, Mike and his crew up there, especially the track crew, uh, to get the track ready through, uh, like Scott was saying, these uh, difficult weather, hot one day, warm, cold, ice. Uh, to be able to ready the first qualifier was a feat in itself. So I just want to thank him. And uh, Chester's right around the corner. We start April 3rd. First qualifier is March 25th. So thank you very much. Sorry, we spoke to you Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, last name's uh, Harant, H-A-R-A-N-T. Thanks, Mike. Uh, I'm not sure if Kim is on. I know he's in Florida for HHI convention. Kim Hankins, are you on the call? I didn't think you would be. I would be. I would be. I would be. How about how about Todd? Todd Mosteller? Yeah, I'm here. No report. Thank you, Todd. Uh, Jeff, Jeff Maddy. I'm here. Uh, Jeff Maddy from the PTHA. That's J E F F Maddy M A T T Y. Uh, we're making this office transition here. I'd just like to again thank Sal Bunda and our board members. As we uh, go through this new uh, this new phase here at the PTHA, we missed a few days of racing in the past few weeks. But honestly, I'd like to commend our track superintendent. It was it was more so on the jocks not wanting to ride in the weather as opposed to track conditions. I think he's done a great job with our track. And then lastly, I'd like to just thank Dave and Seth Bajan again for creating Parks Madness. Uh, our horsemen are very excited and they're anticipating the increased overnight purses along with a few stakes to be able to run. So I'd just like to, to thank him, and uh, yeah, that's all for right now. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Uh, do we have Mike or Jim Simpson on from the Standard Rift Breeders? No, no Mike. Oh, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, I just want to thank 
Okay, Mike. And Brian, you're up. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Um, first, I'd like to say that the uh, PHBA um, intends to be supportive for the advanced imaging study of uh, Dr. Portvet <coughs> and uh, Dr. Holster uh, uh, by uh, uh, getting in touch with as many um, board members and their trainers uh, to make courses available for the study. Uh, we think it's uh, a great study, and, uh, and again, we'll, we'll, we'll be supportive. Uh, the, um, the first page of our agenda is the uh, slot, uh, slot revenue transfer breathing fund. Uh, it's only been one month in the month of January, but we're up $812,000. Uh, and that's basically because the first couple of weeks of January last year, there, there was no racing. So we didn't have any revenues coming in from that. Um, the second item is our uh, 2022 Stein series uh, for two-year-olds. Uh, we met recently with uh, our Stein principals who came up with uh, um, uh, some ideas and we wanted to know uh, which one of those ideas uh, would they uh, uh, like the most or they put could uh, have the most impact and that was a two-year-old PA sired PA bred stallion series so in order to be eligible for the series you must have been uh, sired for a, uh, a by a PA stallion registered stallion and also PA bred um, our first two races will uh, uh, take place uh, on uh, uh, August 22nd. Oh, there's four races all together. One for a uh, one for the Phillies and, and one for the Colts um, or two year olds. Uh, August 22nd on PA Day. The races will be our uh, first two races. There'll be hundred thousand dollar stakes. Um, the second uh, two races uh, will be on September 24th during PA Derby Day. I would like to thank both David. Um, and uh, well, actually, David, um, Joe Wilson, uh, Sal Abunda, and Jeff Maddy for uh, for helping in uh, in letting us um, have those two races on the PA Derby Day. Um, <clears throat> for this year, there's not going to be any nomination fees, no enter fees, and no start fees. We want to make sure that we get this out to everyone and be able to uh, to get as many horses as we can. Um, one of the your questions is probably going to be, well, how many PA sire PA bred horses do you have? Well, we have uh, 335 registered right now, uh, currently 162 uh, boys and 172 girls. Um, so. Uh, and again, we know that there's more that aren't registered yet. I've already talked to a couple of people who said that they will be getting them uh, registered now. Uh, we wanted, again, we wanted to do something uh, to, uh, you know, with a, with a bang uh, for uh, Pennsylvania. And uh, our staying principals thought that this was going to be the uh, uh, top, uh, top item. Any questions on that? Okay, uh, the last point here was the Penn Vet Research Grant uh, presentation. We're going to have that uh, on next Tuesday, March 1st, from 1 to 2 p.m. at uh, New Bolton Center. Um, we'd like to uh, thank Mary Robinson and her team. Uh, they've done a, uh, an outstanding job so far in progressing. If you remember, we donated $300,000 approximately three years ago. Uh, and uh, we'll be donating another $150,000 uh, on March uh, 1st. Again, uh, it's important to the breeders and should be important to everyone to be able to detect in advance injury and also gene doping. Any questions on that? 
Okay, I'd like to thank the um, uh, commissioners uh, for their uh, resolution uh, to uh, to go to the uh, governor in reference to the Resource Development Trust Fund. Um, as you know, whether money's taken or money's not taken, which we don't feel it, it will be, uh, the breeders are hurt, hurt the most because our breeding season just started a few days ago. And people always say, well, if he's trying to take the money, what, you know, I have to worry about three, four years down the road. So I'd like to thank the commission uh, uh, for that. And I just want to tell the governor that he's probably done more to harm the breeding and racing industry in recent history. Fortunately, I'd like to thank the overwhelming group of legislators, both Republicans and Democrats, who think this is a bad idea. Thank you. Uh, Brian Sanfratello, S-A-N-F-R-A-T-E-L-L-O. Thank you, Brian. Um, one thing I would say, I, I agree with Brian, I think that owners of your trainers should submit their horses to Dr. Robinson's study, and maybe Dr. Robinson could, um, is there a way for people to contact you for the, the radiology study and stuff if they're interested in doing that? So just to clarify, it's actually not my study, it's Dr. Uh, Kyla Orkbett and Dr. Kate Wolster's study. Uh, I, I'm really just the matchmaker here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but absolutely, you can certainly reach out to either of them. Their email is available on the PennVet website, um, and we can make that available to this group sure. as well. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for everybody. Um, at this time, there is no public comment, Madam Chair. Very good. I'll announce that our next meeting is scheduled for Tuesday, March 29th at 1 o'clock here in the same room. Motion. Yes. 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 Yes.